It's time for the Access of Easy podcast, the weekly technology digest that keeps you ahead of the curve. Brought to you by EasyDNS.com. Welcome back, everybody, to the Access of Easy podcast edition. This is the uh, sidekick, the compendium, the audio portion of the weekly newsletter from Access of Easy from Easy DNS. My name is Joey. Here is always with my co-host, Len. Buddy, what's going on? Great shirt. Nice shirt. Yeah. I purposely done. I timed it, the wash, perfectly <laughs> so I could wear it. And for those on the audio, obviously you can't see what I'm doing, but it's the Easy DNS shirt. What a beautiful shirt. Talk to Mark if you want to get. I'm pretty sure he has some for sale, and they're just beautiful shirts, and I use wear it all the time, particularly when we record this. Yeah, everything's good here, Joy, and just enjoying the weather. It's clearing up. It's all good here. How about you? Uh, things are good, man. No complaints. I got the house to myself this weekend, me and the pup. Um, for people who want to buy that easy DNS shirt, Mark was telling us privately that uh, with inflation, those shirts are going up to $75 per. So now's, your, now's the time. You got to get one yeah. now. Pretty soon, inflation well, hitting everybody hard, Len. Yeah, and we're gonna, we're gonna get like forty bucks of a cut for that, right? Like, for, <laughs> sure. if I don't would, know. Is that what he said? <laughs> well, whoever's gonna get that for seventy five bucks, it is worth seventy five. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> clearly, you might be able to find something else better, in my opinion. But I, I don't even know what it would be the cost. Uh, I mean, did he even give you a ballpark figure? How much these cost? I, I have no idea. They're great shirts, though. Actually, yeah. uh, not to get too far off the beaten path here, but at the Canadian Bitcoin Conference, Greg Foss went on stage wearing. Uh, the easy DNS logo, and he had lots to say about lots of things. So that was a good presentation. Anyway, we're we're far afoot here. Um, like I mentioned, this is number three hundred four. Let's get into it here with the quote of the week from last week: "Success is getting what you want. Happiness is getting is wanting. I should say what you get." That was from Dale Carnegie. Uh, our winner from last week is Tony. Well done and congrats. This week's quote: "Give me self control, but not now." Uh, that is from Unknown. So you guys know the rules. You can't Google it. No searching, no cheating. If you know, post it in the comments and you get your next renewal on the house, uh, courtesy of DNS. So that's always good stuff. Let me got five stories tonight. I see in the list another GPT issue. You continue to have crystal ball capabilities on uh, Access of Easy. Let's get into it, buddy. And it's not just that. There's also another AI story we have to talk about. Well, we won't get into that just yet because number one, well, incredibly the most thin-skinned people in the U.S. government belong to the Pentagon. I had no idea this was the case, but, well, the Pentagon's version of the Secret Service, and this is known as the U.S. Army Protective Services Battalion, well, they have a lot on their plate, and this is including checking out social media websites, so they're going to be going online to just troll to see if there's anything on there that may be disparaging for, or any disparaging remarks made against any of the top officials. What a job to have. Just go out there and make sure that there's nobody making any disparaging remarks. And this even applies to staffers that were retired. So if you are... I can't help but laugh. Like, honest to God. This is great. Like, you you get this for life. It's like Secret Service for the the, the president, (laughs) except you get the the Pentagon's equivalent. But, man, how how thin-skinned are you if these guys are looking... You know, think about it. These guys got to go through boot camp and all that. And I mean, they would be able to ha- dish out criticism. I'm assuming taking criticism at the same time. But say it online, oh, no, that, that is against <laughs> the, our rules and regulations. Heck that. Anyways, but part of the tasks of this uh, U.S. Army Protective Services Battalion is to prevent assassination, kidnapping, injury, or embarrassment. So three of the four, the first three, I could totally get that. Th- these might be prime targets for just about anything. But really, the fourth embarrassment, come on, man. That's like third grader stuff. And they're looking for disinformation. And we've heard this term bantied around so many times. And in fact, this whole uh, protective services battalion, it's not cheap. It's very costly to the taxpayers. I tried digging around to see how much this cost the public, but it's not available. You can't find what is their overall budget unless you were able to find it. I came up negative here. So this information, unfortunately, you can't find. It cost them 
it costs the taxpayers a lot of money. And part of their services is to make sure there's no embarrassing or disparaging remarks made against ex existing staffers or retired staffers. Come on. This is the most thin skin stuff I've ever seen. And if anybody should not have thin skins, it should be army people, our generals and high and higher ups in the army. But come on, man, this is absolute jokes. Can I hit you with a quote from the article? This is great. Because it, it ties into what we've been saying about other services over the last you know few months we've been doing the show. The Army planned to use these tools not just to detect online quote-unquote threats, but also pinpoint the exact location by combining various surveillance techniques and data sources. The document cites access to Twitter's fire hose, which would grant the Army the ability to search public tweets and Twitter users without restriction, as well as analysis of 4chan, Reddit, YouTube, and Vitankate, I don't know what that one is, a Facebook knockoff popular in Russia. Internet chat platforms like Discord and Telegram will also be scoured for the purpose of, quote, identifying counterterrorism and counterextremism and radicalization. Though it's unclear exactly what those terms mean here. We are fudged, buddy. <laughs> well these, guys, these guys are talking about a lot of stuff that looks crazy to me. And they have access to all these, all these like data tools and stuff like that's God mode and all these accounts. Right? Remember when Elon took over Twitter and there was some leaks even before he took over Twitter about what God mode looks like on that platform. You know, seeing whether someone's shadow banned, what their location is, all that stuff. We can't have this under the guise of I don't like what people are saying about the way that I dress, like, because that's basically how how deep this could go. And it's not like that's crazy. We've seen the U.S. government do and say things under the thinnest of veils over the last 20 years. At least that's how long ish I've been paying attention. Like I'm, I'm 35, but you know, this is <laughs> just, I can't believe it. I, I'll leave you with this. There's a great picture of a, a U.S. general who I don't believe has ever actually served in a war and a, one of his counterparts from about 40 years ago. And it's their, basically their official photo. And in the official photo, the current general is decorated. He looks like uh Augusto Pinochet with all the all the badges and, and colors. He's never shot a gun, never served in a war. And his counterpart, who was in a war, I believe WWE 2, this other guy, I wish I could remember his name or source the picture. Eisenhower? Has, I don't know, but he has almost nothing on his... his uh, on or his Patton? Fatigues. Maybe, but he has nothing, and fatigues might be the wrong word. He's got nothing on his uniform. You know, it's a, these guys used to serve because they wanted to serve. Now they're basically bureaucrats. And so instead of military values, you get bureaucratic bullshit and this is a great example of that well a lot of it is technology too because in the past or especially if you're going far far back the generals had to be closer to the front lines in order to convey their orders now because of technology you don't have to do that you could do it much further away um remember norman schwarzkopf from the it was a desert storm and or the first iraq war and he, he was a, a general he was a top general in the u.s army and he got a lot of publicity during that time. And he was there, right, in the front lines. He was, uh, well, maybe not the front lines, but just behind it. He was directing troops and everything. He's probably one of the last generals that you speak of that is there, um, quote-unquote, firing guns. Maybe he wasn't, quote-unquote, firing guns, so to speak, but very, very close to it. But, yeah, check him out. It was, there's a good uh, If You might be him. the only guy in my lifeline that asked me seriously, serious question, serious face, do I remember Norman Schwarzkopf from Desert Storm 1? There's no, no one will ever, the, for the rest of my life on this earth, no one will ever ask me that question again. You'll be the only no, there's a, There's an awesome debrief after they started the war and he was there doing the debrief and they had the slides and everything. This is old school. They didn't have like PowerPoint and he was just ripping into Saddam Hussein's uh, ability to direct <laughs> his troops. It, it's a very good, it's like a 45 minute video. If you ever is have time to watch. Yeah, hell yeah, it is. Yeah. I'll have to check it out. Yeah, it's not bad. Let's move on. Let's talk about Blue Sky. And I've heard about this in the past. I'll be perfectly honest, but I didn't learn very much about it. And uh, today I learned, well, quite a bit more. It's a Twitter product. It's their very own product that is a decentralized social network protocol. And in fact, in this Blue Sky uh, app or protocol, you're able to, to type in messages as long as 300 characters versus Twitter's 280 if you don't have a blue check mark. Ooh. So there is some advantages to there, plus being decentralized. But, um, well... Users of Blue Sky are now asked to sign in what they call anti meta fetty pact, and which outlines that's uh, well, there looks like looks like they're going out uh, against something called Project 92, which has been deemed to be a real and serious threat to Blue Sky and Twitter, of course. 
The threat is to the federated network, and it's a volunteer-run system where specific users run its own rules and policies. So that's the decentralized nature of it. So Project 92, and this is the thing that is ruffling feathers over there at Twitter land and the higher-ups over there. It's an inter inst sorry, it's an Instagram's internal name for a, a soon-to-be-released social media app or platform that's going to rival Twitter. And it's still in development, and it said it's going to include features like live video and a few other goodies that may attract some users. It's expected to be released sometime in 2023, but don't hold me to that if that doesn't turn out to be true. And looking at this, it's kind of a, it's a whole bunch of nonsense. Like if you have a competing platform that is emerging, you can't have people sign off on something to prevent them from using it, or <laughs> at least you know what I mean. Like let the best product win. Don't shut people out because it's deemed to be a threat. Capitalism is uh, that's when you have the best product wins that people decide with their wallet or with their eyeballs what is best and trying to shun people out for whatever reason I, that's not the way to do things that, that is I don't know I, I look at that and it looks like weak sauce to me but whatever uh, I think this is more just a, a nuisance more than anything if project 92 wants to roll out something I don't think any signing a pact is going to change people's opinions from even looking or dealing with anything with it is people are just going to do what they want that's the reality but very weak sauce from twitter can i propose to you that facebook instagram whatever already has a platform like twitter that supports video picture and text and they just call it facebook like wh why are they I, i'll never understand this this is a bit of a tangent for me but there's a lot of people who think zuckerberg is like this master operator and capital allocator I don't think there's anybody worse, honestly. And I, I didn't know much about the guy before that, you know, story came out and they made a movie, The Social Network, about how he might or might not have rugged the Winklevoss twins, with, and, you know, on the Facebook idea. The more I hear from Zuckerberg and the, the sort of Facebook meta Instagram camp, the more I think that he really has no good ideas. I can't think of a single thing that he's brought to market that he didn't just buy with his billions uh, that has been a success. Instagram stole a bunch of stuff from Snapchat. This is this is like the millennial update, by the way, for the apps on your phone. Instagram stole a bunch of stuff from Snapchat. Facebook stole a bunch of stuff from Twitter. And now it sounds like they're going to try and merge Twitter features, Instagram features, which Facebook already is. The blue Facebook app on your phone already is and call it something else. I don't understand this at all. Am I missing something here? What What, what is the other feature that's going to draw people to this? He'd be cannibalizing users on his own platform more than anything else. I think Twitter for a lot of people, guys like you and me, you know, it's it's for news, research, memes, and uh, I don't know, dunking on people who don't own any Bitcoin, really. Like, what what else do you use it for? It's just not that kind of crowd. So I'm not sure why they would do this, to be honest with you. Well, we're in a Bitcoin echo chamber, so we're probably not getting the, the full range of spectrum. Which oh, is speak offered. for yourself. It's NBA free agency season. I'm paying attention I, to all kinds of stuff. I don't get any of that. So, like, yeah, so you're least... still talking about athletes from 30 years ago and war generals from 30 years ago. No wonder you think you're in a bubble. Yeah, <laughs> of course I live in a bubble. But in terms of, I mean, I, I'm going to just dive deep a little bit further into this topic. Instagram, was that homegrown or did they purchase that from somebody else and then they bu they further develop? They so, that. okay, that... that you know what they paid for Instagram? Uh, I, think I wouldn't even have like, a clue. This was in 2000, 2012, maybe 11 or 12. They paid $1 billion for it. And it was this mind numbing number for a startup that had, you know, not too, too, too many users. It wasn't super popular yet. And uh, now that thing is basically synonymous with photo posting, you know, as much as even I try and get away from my, uh, my millennial, um, you know, instincts to post everything that I'm doing constantly. I still find myself using Instagram from time to time. Um, turned out to be a great buy, but yeah, to answer your question, it, it's not a homegrown product. They bought it from uh, from an independent company. So really, they hit a home run with Facebook, or sorry, Zuckerberg hit a home run with Facebook. Maybe like Zuckerberg hit a home right, run. Right. Right. I mean, he, for whatever reason, he was able to capitalize on that. Timing was just about everything, uh, and this applies not just to him though. But everything else too. A lot of it is timing. You can have an idea, but if you're a few years too early or too late, it's going to be impossible to execute and to be successful at the same time. Yeah. You'll have a lot of, you know, it's going to be more difficult to, to move forward. But we can move on. And this is something else which may have the difficulty executing what they're trying to do. We can't go a week without talking about AI. And this is Google's turn to well to be discussed. Their very own bard, and it's making news. 
because Google is telling their employees not to enter any confidential into BARD. And the reason for this, well, it's plain obvious. They don't want information to be leaked out if there's going to be a question posed later on and then it's going to draw from the database. And well, if it's confidential information, obviously it doesn't shouldn't have that information available to it. But since this is a Google product, let's be honest, it's got a treasure trove of data that it can tap into if it wanted. Gmail, sure. all of us. Google Drive, all of us. All of us use Google. Uh, let's yeah. be honest. Uh, how many people don't use Google? And the ones that aren't, I'd love to know what you're using. But everybody that's using a Google product, like the, their search engine, all those queries you're doing, again, that, that is information that they can tap into. YouTube is another product they have that's just a, a wealth of information and so much more that they have. But Google, they're alerting their engineers to avoid direct use of computer code. This is something else that the chat box can generate. Some people are saying. So it's kind of it's funny that they're, they're doing this. They don't they don't have faith in the code that's going to be created by the AI. Is there going to be substandard code created by it? I even tried to, to do something today. I logged on to Bard, signed up, and I asked it to create a code for me. And you know what? The code that it created for me was decent. I asked it to create mm -hmm. generating a Bitcoin address in C. It did it. Very, you know, a few lines. But it worked. And I scanned it. I, I know C, okay, I'm pretty good with it. I saw no issues with it. So I'm not sure why they're telling their engineers to avoid to use the, the code that is generated by the chatbot. But I don't know. If there's, there's something there that they're telling the, the engineers to do. So it's a red light for people that are using BARD. There could be some problems with it moving forward. And this is very bad news for Google because ChatGPT has been getting a lot of press. And if they're not able to execute BARD and make it a competing product that appears to be better, they're going to be left behind. I've been impressed with the Microsoft product and the ChatGPT product, obviously the OpenAI product. I think, you know, maybe you know more about this than me. I'd be curious what your take is. Is it possible that because the, the bots basically learn from data creeping that rival companies or bad actors could flood the bot with poor code or malicious code for something simple like generate me a website, um, you know, that I can use with uh, easy press or something like that. And then what they get instead is code that looks good, works well, but has a backdoor pumped in there. I don't know. Like to me, that would be the thing that makes the most sense. Like you could kind of convince the bot that something was correct and have the bot interpret this as what the, what the obvious next line of text is right as the answer. But then really what you're getting is something with a, a bit of a security vulnerability. Also worth noting, I think we talked about this before that, uh, the open, the open, uh, free and open source versions of this GPT text prediction, you know, chatbot software, uh, seem to be running away with the race and to, to have Google really laying the, you know, or putting the guardrails on this um, among other companies, right? The article mentions that Microsoft, Deutsche Bank, uh, Amazon, Samsung, and Apple all doing the same kind of guardrailing with their use in house. Um, tells you something, right? There's there's concern there for, from companies that honestly, you know, think about the number of times you've heard any of those companies concerned about almost anything at all. You know, you can count them on your fingers and toes. And now they're all suddenly very concerned about this thing. It's something there. I don't know what, but something there. Don't you think that if there's something malicious in there and the fact that is machine learning, it should be able to detect it and root it out. I mean, if you take a step back and look at what Google has done on the AI side of things, it created a program to teach itself to play chess. And through that, it became the most dominant chess program in the world. It even beat Stockfish, which used to be the king of the castle. It absolutely throttles it nowadays. Also, Google Go, that it, it's a game that is very difficult to learn, but it learned by itself and it became a quote unquote grand champion in that. So it seems like they're able to, to have code or programs that could learn, so to speak. So why couldn't this type of thing also learn when something is malicious. Uh, yeah, I don't know. I don't know. I mean, some questions that, well, again, I, I go back to it. It's artificially intelligent. It's not artificial intelligence. That's right. Exactly. Yeah. So we'll move on. We got some more phone tracking stuff that's in the news. Every week we have this. And it looks like this one has some alleged ties to the FBI. So apparently authorities want to keep the secrets of the tracking tech just under the radar. They don't want this released. Because police, in fact, are dropping charges on a frequent basis when they're using this tech, when they catch suspected violent criminals. And the reason why they're dropping it is because this way they can protect 
the technology secrets. That's very interesting that they'll do that. So they have the, the goods on them. They just don't want to, to proceed because they want to keep everything a secret. That's kind of nuts. The nature of the attack on the phone comes in a variety of manners. Some attacks open up the ability to listen into calls while others uh, do unauthenticated commands used to break encryption or degrade the connection to a less robust network. Break encryption. So if you have full disk encryption, I'm sure that's going to break that. Also, it's peer-to-peer uh, chats that use encryption, I probably think it's going to break that as well. So the only way these attacks can happen and land on your phone is if you download a program or if they're able to find a way to circumvent something where you just go on a website and it just the code just ends up on your code on your phone and it runs itself, which is very, very troubling if that's the case, if authorities are indeed doing this. But well, the amount of data that they could steal from us, it's unreal. And it, again, it just leads to the, the, the whole thing we've been talking about all this time is make sure your phone is up to date. Be very careful when you're doing stuff online. And, you know, don't just willy nilly start clicking on stuff or opening up anything because you might open up a Pandora's box that may never be closed and you may never know it's there. It's never been open. So they could be spying on you for all this time and you just have no idea. You really have to do some networks sniffing just to make sure that everything is on the up and up. So be very careful. If the FBI is doing this, this is nuts that the government is taking care of this. But whatever, I'm not surprised. Uh, you know what? Like you're you're giving a lot of good information there, good advice about taking care of your network security and you know how encryption can help you and being cautious and and you know judicious in the things you download. But let's face it, you know my friends and I all laughed at e at each other when after a night of talking about some product, you know after ten beers each, the next morning all our phones are advertising that product to us, even though we've never discussed it before. You know the, the FBI. <laughs> and whatever you know, whatever lettered agency you want to talk about, they don't need software to do this stuff. You're giving it to them anyway. Yeah, the number of people I know, and I'm guilty of this too. Like I have a Sonos in my house. The, the Sonos, the recent update, I, sh I shouldn't say recent. It's probably about a year ago now. But this update basically demanded that you allow Amazon, like Amazon's voice rack service, to be on the device, even if you don't use it. And so. I'm sure this thing is listening to me talk about all sorts of stuff. My TV just did an update today. I plugged my TV back in now that I'm, you know, now that I sold my house and uh, it, it needed to do a software update. And I can see in there this, you know, privacy disclaimer about how it uses the information that it gathers from, from its sort of ambient uh, noise, uh, you know, s s selector or whatever. Uh, your phone, your computer, hell man, even this camera, who knows what, what you know, where the, some of this information is going. Um, we upload this file to to different places, YouTube, whatever. All this stuff together, I don't think people realize, as computing power becomes cheaper, more efficient, more effective, you really could paint a perfect picture of yourself for an advertiser, for a potential romantic partner, and for law enforcement to put you through the ringer. And I, I think people need to be more careful about that. I think my generation is the first to kind of think about this in a way that uh, – in a way that makes us defensive. I don't know what the generation after me is like, but I think that's going to be sort of the, that, that's going to be the front line of this next battle. You know, you've, you've said before on the show that information has become really a commodity. And uh, this is a good example of that. Everything you do is valuable to somebody and all together, it's, it's really worth something to have a, a complete picture of who somebody is and how they operate. You can take some precautions, um, free, Sorry, open source software and hardware, which can be verified and it's reputable, can give you some level of protection along those lines. You, you got to use software that respects the uh, res the privacy and freedom of the user. The Free Software Foundation that is headed by or was headed at one time by Richard Stallman is, is a he's a huge advocate of this too. He's a little bit of of a oddball. Uh, so to speak, but uh, he, he speaks a lot of truth. So if anybody's more interested in that type of stuff, check him out, especially on YouTube. But uh, again, he's very unique. And But he, he says a lot of good things. If you are able to use the right software and the right hardware, you can mitigate a lot of these problems out there. And uh, you know I, the fact that you're saying that they, they have this information already, to be perfectly honest, I, I know you have an Apple phone that's, that's stock. Apple is taking that information, but they're not giving it to the anybody they're keeping it in house they may be selling that information but it's not being shared with the authorities the way i understand it they have to ask for it and it's somehow it's got to be given in, in that direction do you, do you think so, do you think honestly that there's a lot of asking going on i i th i think so i don't think there's a direct connection between the two i think there's still there there's an ask and there's a, a you know um yes and no 
Mm-hmm. Um, so th- 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 what I'm trying to get at, I don't think that there is just software built in, even in your Apple phone or stock Android, that is directly giving information straight to like the FBI. They have no, to me neither. But, but like, but like pragmatically, what's the difference between Apple giving them the metadata and they, you know what I mean? Like, like from yeah, a, from I'm hundred percent. Yeah, there's no. Fir- oh, we lost you, Joey. Your mic cut out. I'll just speak while I, I, I'm I'm 100% in agreement with you. you did, when you get that thing going, just start talking. Maybe I'll give you a heads up if it's working or not. No, <laughs> it's not working. So I, that's why I, I installed Graphene OS on my phone, because that way I can ensure that I have the capability to stop anything. It's free and open source. And unfortunately, I think your mic is still not working. So. Is it on now? It is not on now. So let's move on before this. All, oh, all I want to say was there's no there's not enough friction in between getting the information and giving it to somebody who could use it against you. And I don't yeah, see that changing I, anytime soon. I agree. I agree. So last story on the docket is more AI talk. And this one is chat GPT. <laughs> Can't go really a week without them. But Singapore is involved with this one. I mean, you know, we haven't talked much about Singapore in some time in our show, the CPP. But anyways, th- there's a cybersecurity firm in Singapore called Group IB. Joy, name, what do you want to give this one? This uh, is that's, a, that's, a, that's a zero. Too lame. <laughs> A group might be, but yeah. it gets better. We'll talk about it Irri- in a like, ir- like irritable bowel, group of irritable bowel. Is what, that is. <laughs> like, what is that? Never Come even on. thought. <laughs> so they reported, they reported over 100,000 login credentials uh, for OpenAI's ChatGPT um, software, their chatbot. And this information was leaked on the dark web. And this information that was taken and eventually leaked started back in June 2022. So I don't know when ChatGPT became a <laughs> thing, so to speak, but. Um, maybe around that time. And they're saying 26,802 stolen logins were leaked to the dark web. Here's the name that we got to be uh, <laughs> scrutinizing. The Raccoon Info Stealer Malware. That Raccoon <laughs> Info Stealer. I, I'm going to give that a one out of five. That's pretty pretty bad. I like that. Happy. I have like an <laughs> ongoing, I, I have like a saga, you know, it's like five or six years now living in my house. That I've, I've oh, I remember this. The neighborhood. And then back at my my dad's house too, raccoons all the time. I hate raccoons, but my God, are they cunning animals? I'm gonna give that one uh 2.8, 2.8. Okay, I'm I'm the French judge giving it a one. <laughs> so it was responsible for stealing the data, and the malware it was uh, done after receiving a phishing email. So people they received the phishing email, they clicked the link, and the malware was installed. And, and unfortunately, there you go. So login credentials, history cookies that were saved in web browser browsers were all taken and even this spreads to maybe even what they say crypto wallets now i wonder if this hack has anything to do with the recent atomic wallet hack that was announced about a month a month and a half ago that was pretty big news in our sphere but there's been no resolution to, to as for why that happened and uh if they closed the loophole there is this the reason I do not know. But one thing that you do have to ensure that use two-factor authentication, the and OTP, one word, and OTP, is a good open source two-factor authentication that is available through F-Droid for you Android users. And it's, like I mentioned, open source. You could back this up as well. So it, use something along those lines. Do your own research, whatever works. But definitely use something like two-factor authentication because it is going to help you because it looks like they're recommending you change your passwords. And if that's the case, it looks like all the information is potentially there for the taking. So too bad, so sad. I just want to know, like I don't have a lot to add to the, the sort of you know guts of this story, but one thing we talked about a bunch is that there's always a pretty big gap between these leaks and thefts and the announcement of the leaks and thefts. And so here's another example. You're, you know, what is it? Eight months now where maybe this information was leaked or you were vulnerable and didn't know, or, or, you know, weren't looking for these things. This isn't right. I don't know. I don't know what the laws are here. And I know there's, you know, a lot of DOJ mentions district courts, blah, 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 unsealing of documents. Fine. I get that. But Where's the public interest, right? In the spirit of, uh, you know, in the spirit of consumer protection, which is all the rage in the United States at the moment, where is the effort to educate the public? You know, you can get all manner of uh, PSAs being handed out from government uh, at any hour of the day or night, any day of the week, any month of the year for things that just don't matter and really shouldn't be paid for with taxpayer dollars. Something like this. These people's, you know, in some cases, their 
their savings, their livelihoods, whatever. Not to mention that as the chat GPT honeypot grows, if you can pump in a couple of suspect search queries under someone else's name, that's worth oh. something. That's worth something. So that's, <laughs> you know, dicey, very dicey. I'm surprised. That, well, not surprised, but I'm disappointed they don't share this stuff earlier. Well, we're kind of preoccupied with submersibles and smoke <laughs> that is, uh, that is, you know, engulfing a lot of cities. But I mean, I guess it's interesting to smoke too. It, from what I understand, based on this Globe and Mail article, it's attacking more or impacting more uh, people that are poor, and um, also they also quote black people as well. So, yeah. uh, interesting that the smoke is attacking those groups of people rather than racist everybody. Smoke. Yeah, racist it is smoke. very racist. Yeah, I, I, interesting. I, what an awesome article, by the way. Just we, I, I get, love we gotta get we gotta get that article on uh, access of easy. We gotta we gotta petition Mark to throw that one in there. This is smart <laughs> smoke. We gotta get we gotta get on this. This is a security threat, I think. Yeah, I, I don't want to attack groups of people. If it's gonna be doing it, do it indiscriminately. It just just everybody gets it. Speaking of speaking of smoke, this is not on not on the docket, but uh this these riots in France, have you seen this? So it was a, a team that was killed by the police. Is that what if I you go on, if you look at the real fly on Twitter, who's another Bloomberg, you know, headline tweeter and commenter, the videos are insane. And he brought up a good point earlier today. Like li the literal city is on fire. Police are being sh like shot at and attacked, looting all over the place. It looks like the Floyd riots, honest to God. And, and the Tour de France, the Tour de France starts in two days. Mm. Well, yeah. but this was all stemming from uh, it was a team. I don't. I've, I have no idea what happened. No okay. idea. Okay, that's the way I understand it. I, I don't know much more than that. So, it's France. I mean, I don't want to make light of this situation because if somebody died to, to actually get to this point, that's that's very sad news. But yeah. there's been, I mean, all the time France riots. It just it's almost like um, I don't want to say it's a pastime thing. But maybe this time there's justification rather than just garbage piling up that's causing them to get we're gonna, angry. We're gonna see. I'm I'm curious about the Tour de France. That's that's gonna be big. Like if you if they can't have that, if they have to delay it, if they have to, that's public publicly humiliating, man, for a country that um, you know could use probably some good press uh, and some goodwill among its people. Anyway, the story for another time. Uh, that's thanks for listening, everyone. That was number three oh. I closed all my tabs. Three oh four. four. I believe, yeah. Okay, so uh, we'll see you here next week, same time, same place. Until then, take care of yourselves. Yeah, take care.